Welcome everyone to Improving Public Comment Review with Automation, Machine Learning, and Advanced Analytics, RTI Smart Review. My name is Cindy Denunzio, and I will be moderating this webinar. This next slide shows a snapshot of our agenda for the webinar. Each year, federal agencies are required to obtain input on potential policy changes via a public comment period. The relevant comments received for any one program may be a small portion of the overall comments received. Therefore, timely identification of relevant comments is critical to maximize the time the government has to review, consider, and respond. This is why RTI developed the data science tool and workflow, RTI Smart Review. I would like to introduce the RTI Smart Review team who will participate in this webinar. First is Kim Danforth. Kim is a senior research public health analyst in the Healthcare Quality and Outcomes Center at RTI. Rob Chu is a senior research data scientist in RTI's Center for Data Science. Anna Goodwin is a research data scientist in RTI's Center for Data Science. And lastly, Ian Thomas is also a research data scientist in RTI's Center for Data Science. We will start off the presentation with Kim Danforth. Okay, thanks, Cindy. So I'm going to describe some factors that motivated the development of RTI Smart Review. And as Cindy just said, and as many of you know, federal agencies obtain input on proposed rules through a public comment period. This allows members of the public to submit written comments, and these comments can lead to changes in the final policies. Our work focused on the physician fee schedule rule, which is updated annually and uses a typical comment period of 60 days. Our goal was to identify comments relevant to the Medicare Shared Savings Program, but the same process could be applied to other rules or programs, and so we'll be speaking about our work in general terms throughout the presentation. Next slide. So I want to provide some context for the challenges involved in public comment review for a large role like the Physician Fee Schedule or PFS. The PFS is used by many government programs to implement policies, and as a result, a large number of comments are received each year. For the last several years, this averaged about 35,000 comments a year. However, only a small portion of those comments are relevant to any one program. Over the last few years, there were less than 200 comment submissions per year that were relevant to the program we supported. And so the initial challenge was identifying those relevant comments or finding that so-called needle in the haystack. Additionally, multiple programs may propose policies on similar topics, and so there may be similar or overlapping comments that are submitted as a result. A recent example of this is the expansion of telehealth as a result of the ongoing public health emergency. Also, a large percent of comments are submitted during the final week of the comment submission period, and this presents a challenge for identifying relevant comments quickly, which is critical because there is often a short turnaround to the final rule, and we want the government to have as much time as possible to review, consider, and respond to public comments. A related challenge is that it is not known in advance how many comments will be received in any given year. Next slide, thanks. Um, so based on these challenges for the PFS, we had several goals as we were developing our review process. First, we wanted to be able to prioritize review of the comments that were most likely to be relevant. Reviewing these comments first facilitates rapid identification of relevant excuse me, comments and allows us to quickly transfer them to the government for their consideration. We also wanted to be able to group related letters together. And as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, there can be form letters or letters that may have been coordinated around some key points that are submitted. We also had an existing comment summary dashboard that we and our client were used to using. And so we wanted any new process we developed to integrate into our existing dashboard and setup. This slide presents a high level overview of our comment review process. We used two parallel review processes to identify relevant comments. So first, we prioritize likely relevant comments for review and rapid transfer to the government. We also ensure all relevant comments are identified through the sequential review of every comment submitted to balance efficiency with thoroughness. After relevant comments are identified, we categorize them based on topic areas determined by the client, draft comment summary documents, and provide support for briefing and other documents as needed. 
today's presentation will focus on the prioritized review process powered by automation and advanced data analytics, and Rob will be speaking about this next. All right, uh, thanks, Kim. Um, in this portion of the webinar, we're gonna provide a high level overview of RTI Smart Review, as well as a summary of how we approach data science at RTI. So for some background, um, I'm a member of RTI Center for Data Science. Our mandate is to be a cross-institute center for excellence, where we partner with domain researchers to address problems with data and technology focus. Um, our team is well-versed in a variety of tools that falls broadly under the umbrella of data science. And um, in selecting tools for a specific project, we believe the only way to add value is to listen and engage with our clients' issues rather than pursuing a specific agenda just for novelty's sake. So in this vein, uh, we developed RTI Smart Review by working closely with the project team prior to and throughout several rulemaking cycles. This allowed us to understand operational issues that the reviewers face during public comment review and how that impacts the client's goals and timeline. This also allowed us to draw upon our collective strengths as a multidisciplinary team and iteratively test our assumptions and incorporate feedback as we learned about what worked and what didn't. Throughout this process, we learned that the most useful way to help the project team during public comment review is by prioritizing comments as they come in with the goal of finding relevant comments as quickly as possible. So with these needs and requirements in mind, uh, we worked together to develop a prototype of RTI Smart Review that reduced several pain points for the project team. And uh, as you see in the slide, this diagram outlines a high level overview of some of the main components of RTI Smart Review. Uh, though we'll cover these components briefly now, uh, Anna will provide more in-depth explanations of many of these features later in the presentation. Um, so first up in the upper left-hand corner, uh, we created a da data pipeline to ingest public comments metadata and attachments automatically from regulations.gov every night. We've recently updated this process to allow project team members to run the automated process at any point. And Ian will be covering this in more detail uh, later. Uh, the ingestion process also extracts, te extracts text from public comment submissions and attachments. Our process can extract text from Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, emails, and PDFs, among other file types. And um, if the text is not machine readable, as part of the pipeline, we'll also convert it to uh, machine readable text. These records are stored in a database. Um, they're represented in a blue box in the middle. Um, and then three automated processes are run, the uh, purple circles on the right. Uh, one is a keyword tagging module that's used to flag comments containing keywords of interest selected by the project team and client to help identify relevant comment submissions. Number two, a clustering module used to group comments into mutually exclusive groups based on the semantics of the text. And three, a machine learning re relevance model that uses examples of relevant and not relevant comments from the current rulemaking to flag potentially relevant comments as they are submitted. Uh, the relevant model, uh, relevance model automatically engages once there's enough data. And this is generally driven by the number of relevant comments which are obtained from the project team's reviews and updated in the comment database as part of this process. Finally, the results of these models are saved to a shared workspace, and the project team uses the process outputs to review the comments, um, and result, the results are entered into an existing Smartsheet reporting dashboard used by the broader team and the client. Um, and then as a knowing that projects are often have custom needs for reporting, we've developed RTI Smart Review to be easily decoupled from Smartsheet if clients have other preferred reporting or business intelligence software. So um, we're going to go a little bit more into the modules here. Um, the, the team created these modules to be a complementary, uh, to be complementary, and to provide support at different times throughout the public comment period. Uh, keyword tagging has many advantages. It can be used immediately once a keyword list is created, and does not require training data. These keywords are often useful since they build on a priori knowledge of what relevance mean for a given rule. Additionally. Keywords can be revi easily revised throughout the rulemaking cycle, providing a flexible and responsive means of updating relevance definitions. Something that could be considered a disadvantage of keyword tagging is that it requires fine-tuning the keyword selection to reduce false positives. 
one strategy to alleviate this issue is to use broader keyword searches early in the process and then refine them over time uh, to iteratively improve in precision. Another possible disadvantage, depending on the rule and policies being proposed, is that it could become burdensome to enumerate all specific keywords or phrases that might indicate relevance. Now, the clustering and the relevance modeling become particularly uh, useful later in the comment period. Uh, so like keyword tagging, clustering can be performed immediately and does not require labeled data for training. However, because we continue to receive comments over time, cluster de definitions can drift if new comments differ significantly from those in the past. Um, as Anna will mention in her section, our solution to this issue is to allow the project team to freeze cluster definitions at a desired date. And lastly, relevance modeling is a nice complement to keyword tagging to identify likely relevant comments from past examples of relevant and not relevant comments. Currently, we have the relevance modeling triggered to train and produce predictions once a certain threshold of relevant comments has been identified by the team. Unfortunately, because of its reliance on training data, this also means that relevance modeling results are not immediately available. Uh, the utility of this model may vary by rule or by year, depending on the number of relevant comments received and how many policies were proposed. The model will work better with more relevant comments than when the language used to indicate relevance is more homogeneous. An advantage of our relevance model implementation uh, is that it will turn on automatically when it reads a user set threshold of relevant comments. This requires no additional work for the project team since it's already embedded within the, the pipeline. Okay, to make this all a little bit more concrete, uh, this slide shows the comment volume over time for three cycles of the uh, PFS, uh, the rule in which we developed the original prototype. Members of this audience uh, are probably familiar with public com with, that are familiar with public comment review are uh, will likely be able to relate well to this graph. Usually, the comments right at the beginning um, will come in slowly for the first few weeks after the proposed rule is posted. Then in the center here, the comment volume then picks up at a manageable rate until about the last week or so before the comment period ends, when the number of comments skyrockets until the close of the comment period. There's usually unpredictability in terms of how large the spike in late, uh, late, this late spike in comments will be, which can also uh, often present uh, staffing challenges. And uh, given the stress of needing to address so many comments in the final weeks, the, the uh, clustering and relevance modeling are particularly useful during these late stages of comment review to help with prioritization. Uh, finally, this slide provides uh, some evidence of RTI smart reviews effectiveness in this recent rulemaking cycle. So in the upper left-hand corner, um, during this comment period, we received over 31,000 comments. Of these 31,000 comments, the keyword tagging and rev relevance modeling flagged around 1,100 comments, reducing the prioritized comment value volume by 96.5%. Out of the set, full set of 31,000 comments, only 180 ended up being relevant and requiring written responses. Impressively, RTI Smart Review found 168 of these 180 relevant comments in its prioritized set. This accounted for 93% of all relevant comments, the remainder which were incorporated later as part of the sequential review. So as a result of this prioritization process, we were able to return all relevant comments to the client within two days after the submission end date. Anecdotally, identifying all relevant comments can sometimes take weeks after the close of comment period, causing significant delays in the subsequent review, consideration, and response to relevant comments. So now that you have an overview of RTI Smart Review, I'm going to hand the presentation over to my colleague, Anna Godwin, who will pre present details on some of the RTI Smart Review's main features. Thank you, Rob. On the following slides, I'll be discussing how we've led leveraged user-driven feedback and inputs to add new features and make improvements to our machine learning pipeline. At a high level, this diagram shows the flow of inputs into our machine learning pipeline, which produces our overall prioritized outputs. On the outside of the diagram, you can see we have keyword lists provided by our subject matter experts on the left, which feeds into keyword tagging. 
Additionally, the final determination of comment relevance comes from the project review team and is an input to the relevance modeling shown on the right. The clustering algorithm that's shown in the middle doesn't require any user inputs and instead updates based on the new comments received every night. The automated pipeline has been updated to allow the project team to directly update these inputs, such as the keyword list and the relevance determinations. For instance, if they see a lot of false positives flagged by a keyword, they may want to modify it. If more comp complicated logic is needed for keyword tagging, the Center for Data Science can help. As an example of this, it is only flagging a program's name if it appears outside of the rule title, for instance. And every night when the pipeline runs, it detects these updates and automatically applies them. The first thing I'd like to discuss in detail is the text pre-processing that's required to support our machine learning features. First, all of our attachment text is parsed using Tika optical character recognition. Then we join the text from our posted comment and its corresponding attachment together for the complete text from the posted comment. This complete text is what we supply to our keyword tagging process. For additional text pre-processing, we transform the text into embeddings, which is a common step used in natural language processing. The benefit of using embeddings is that it provides a rich representation of text, grouping similar words and similar context together in a, numer in a numerical format. Embeddings can then be passed into our downstream machine learning processes such as our clustering algorithm and our relevance model. For these next slides, we'll be focusing on keyword tagging and clustering and how we've made improvements based on user-driven feedback over the past year. On these next slides, we'll be diving into keyword tagging features of our pipeline. And when we say keyword tagging, we mean that our subject matter experts are providing a keyword category with corresponding words for the machine learning pipeline to flag. We have a few examples of what we mean by this using animals, as you can see in the example on the right. We have a feline category comprised of the words cat, tabby, and kitten, and a canine category with the words dog, hound, and puppy. If any of the category words are present in the text, that category will be flagged for that particular comment as shown in the bottom right. Our reviewers collaborate with our client to determine the relevant keyword category list to provide to our pipeline, using as many different categories to fly for a given rule. A benefit is the ability for the client to indicate keywords that may be important to them to search for or that they expect to be relevant for a given rule. One of our user-driven improvements has been to expand upon keyword tagging to allow our viewers to see very quickly and easily which corresponding word caused the overall keyword category to be flagged for review. Using our previous example, we can easily see which of the keywords caused the category to flag true for each category. So for the second comment, you can see canine category is true. This was flagged due to the word puppy present in the text. This improvement can help reviewers zero in on the part of the comment that may possibly be relevant and determine if certain keywords need to be adjusted based on what is being observed in the rule. These details can also be helpful in developing comment summaries and briefing documents and responding to comments that come up after the comment submission closes. In addition, another user-driven feature based on experience from multiple rule periods has been providing the ability to exclude certain words from a keyword category. We can add in specific terms for our pipeline and to basically ignore those. For example, we'd want to flag our feline category if cat is in the text, but if cat and American short hair were both present in the text, that text would not be flagged for that category. This is yet another feature that gives our reviewers control of the inputs of our pipeline to produce the prioritized outputs to meet their needs. Previously, keyword tagging updates for the inclusion ex and exclusion criteria were managed through requests made by our, our reviewers to our data science team. 
This meant that there was always time required to put the request into effect, challenging the limited amount of time our reviewers have available to review comments. We've since updated our input list and Smartsheet to allow our reviewers to add this information directly. Our machine learning pipeline connects directly to Smartsheet each night to detect if there's any updates to the keyword criteria and runs using the current keyword list. This gives our reviewers flexibility with their keywords and allows them to adapt quickly to what they're seeing each day during the comment review process. One other expansion we've developed recently is to add different types of tagging to be included. A good example of this is searching for organization names mentioned in the comment. Building on this, our pipeline can be extended to meet as many types of tagging that will support our review team for any given rule, continuing to provide the adaptability our team needs on a per rule basis. As a last note on keyword tagging features, we've extended our process to be run outside of our pipeline. Our pipeline populates a database with comments using the regulations.gov API but we've modified the pipeline a few months ago so that it can be run so that it can run keyword tagging on any set of documents without needing to populate the database via the API. For example, we ran keyword tagging on a set of PDFs and HTML files quickly and easily that had been placed in a folder on one's computer. With each rule iteration, we can continue to work hand in hand with our collaborators to build out keyword features that meet additional needs such as this ad hoc run process. So we've just reviewed our user-driven updates to keyword tagging, and now we'll move on to how we've updated clustering over the past year through a similar iterative approach. Clustering uses the text embeddings that we previously discussed as an input and groups similar documents together. To illustrate this, we have an example of what the clustering output could look like. We see a total of three cluster IDs in the cluster ID column. The machine learning pipeline provides which cluster ID the comment is grouped into, as well as a probability or confidence of that comment's placement into that group. And in listening to our reviewers' feedback, we wanted to make sure that our clustering output was more actionable. As a result, we updated the output to include the opening text for each comment, which can make it easier to identify form letters within a cluster. Continuing to use our animal example from keyword tagging, we can see what this might look like applied to our clustering algorithm. This has allowed our team to quickly see if a cluster group is related to a form letter and gives our reviewers the ability to streamline reviewing many similar form letter documents at one time while they are focused on that content. Our clustering algorithm runs every night, and with the addition of new comments, our model is retrained on new data and produces new results each time. This can mean that a comment that was once in cluster group one could now be in cluster group seven, or that there are now a total of 10 clusters instead of nine. While clustering adapts well to new comments, the shifting clustering results produced each night can make it difficult for the reviewers to use the clusters. In collaborating with them on improving the pipeline, a request was made to be able to freeze clustering at a point in time. Using this diagram as an example, freezing clustering allows for the algorithm to train on the comments highlighted on the left side of the freeze date line. Say that clustering produces a total of 15 clusters. The clustering algorithm keeps those initial comments clustered as is into those 15 clusters. For every new comment received, on the right side of the line, those comments are now placed into the best pre-existing cluster for, from our trained model. Allowing clustering to run as is allows for it to adapt to new comments, which is what we initially want in our process. But by adding a freeze date later in the process, it allows for our model to learn from a majority of the comments and provides stability for our reviewers when they are in the most time sensitive part of their review process when they want to focus on reviewing all comments within particular clusters.
After highlighting our user-driven features from the past year, here's an idea of what our machine learning output looks like. You can see in the top and bottom images, it provides keyword tagging, relevance modeling, and clustering outputs. It also gives our reviewers a URL link straight to the comment posted on regulations.gov so that comment text can easily be accessed. A, a key feature of this output is that it lives alongside the updates our reviewers make to this sheet in the first few columns. We can see who the comment is assigned to, the status of its review, and whether or not it was considered relevant. This information is retained with each nightly run while all of the machine learning outputs are updated based on any new comments received, any keyword tagging updates provided by reviewers, any new cluster outputs and relevance modeling outputs. This covers our machine learning related updates based on our continued collaboration with our users. I'm going to hand it over to Ian, who's going to discuss a few operational updates that the pipelines benefited from based on these conversations as well. Thanks, Anna. So as you can see, um, we've identified how to use machine learning to speed up a critical part of the comment review process, and we're quite happy with the results. Once this was solved, the new problem became quickly prioritizing the incoming comments at the right time, especially during the last week of comment submission. This required attention of a few specialized staff, and we needed to coordinate them to make sure people were access available because otherwise the rest of the team would not be able to continue their work. Next slide, please. Um, so as you've seen previously, towards the end of the comments uh, submission, a high volume of comments are received. This might be 10,000 or more comments submitted in just a few days. By default, our runs are scheduled for midnight. This way comments are prioritized for reviewers at the beginning of the workday, but in order to allow our prioritized reviews to keep up with the pub public comment submissions, we also added a midday machine learning run. Uh, this is run um, after a batch of comments are posted. This is particularly useful when comment submission is high. Um, if a batch of comments are posted midday, it's, in, it's important to be able to run them as quickly as possible. One challenge, however, is that the best time to initiate midday, midday run can change from rule to rule or even day to day based on when new batches of comments are available for review, as well as when the team has completed the existing prioritized reviews. So in order to start machine learning runs for comment posted during the day, project team members would reach out to the Center for Data Science to initiate these midday runs. Uh, this required close coordination between team members and a potential bottleneck would occur if data scientists were not available. Well, we worked closely to prevent this. Our team realized that there would be value in allowing users to initiate machine learning runs. You know, what we wanted was push button data science. And so next slide, please. Um, and so this, this dashboard um, is that push button data science that we were looking for. We created a way for project team members to initiate the machine learning runs with, with a click of the button through a dashboard page, which is shown here. Uh, this main machine learning pipeline dashboard can be accessed from any web browser, but it's limited to the IP addresses we specify in order to limit access to only project members. Because we can't predict when new comments will be available for review, we created a system that allows reviewers to process comments whenever they choose based on the comments, when the comments are released and their work schedules. So now with this system, at any time, a project member can click on the quick run button to quickly start a run and initiate that process. Uh, sometimes, um, there's a need to customize the, the run settings. And so we created a page for reviewers to view or modify the machine learning runs. If the reviewer clicks run instead of click quick run, they'll be taken to a page that allows them to view and adjust the run parameters. This is most often useful for adjusting the start and end dates of the comments to be reviewed, but it can also be used to review or tweak select machine learning parameters. So 
As you may know, in a short turnaround, high pressure environment, timely information is priceless. While reviewers are waiting for the machine learning results, they may want to know where in the process the machine learning run is. If a lot of comments have been posted, uh, this run will take up much longer because it's downloading more attachments, for example. Um, reviewers may want to make sure that that is what's happening and the process um, isn't stuck for some reason. Uh, so in this page, you can see the, the times of the different steps um, that uh, have been run and are currently running. Uh, this new dashboard you know, addresses these issues by giving these run statistics to the user who can now see if the run is on time or mysteriously delayed. And, you know, unfortunately, in, in this world of complex data pipelines, running on new unstructured data, mysterious delays do show up from time to time. So this application includes tools that allow researchers, I'm sorry, reviewers to see when, when things aren't going as planned and gives them a URL to email the data scientist. This screen right here acts as a handoff between the two groups. It provides enough information to let reviewers know that there's an issue, and it gives developers enough information to start the debugging process. The Smart Review Operations Dashboard gives control to the people who have the most context, improving response time across the board. And with that, I will hand it off to Kim. Thanks, Ian. So I think this is a really exciting development. Um, there are several benefits to this new process, as Ian mentioned. It allows the project review team to initiate machine learning runs when it works best for them. And they are most aware of when new comments have been posted. And they can also fit the machine learning runs uh, best into their workflow based on where they are with other prioritized reviews. And I think what makes this exciting is that it is really with a push of a button or, or really a click of a button, they can kick off the automated data pipeline and then monitor the progress of the machine learning run. The alerts and error logging allow project team members to know if there might be an issue that they need to reach out to the Center for Data Science about. And in the, that case, these alerts also speed up technical troubleshooting. So this puts the, the power of the advanced data science pipeline in the hands of the end users. And then we wanted to conclude with some overarching thoughts. So there are a lot of data science methods and tools available for both uh, rulemaking and other work. And to select the best tool for your purpose, you have to have a clear idea of what problem you're trying to solve and what outcomes you want to achieve. And this sounds probably very obvious, but it's a critical step to avoid spending time and money on solutions that don't fit your problem. Multidisciplinary teams and close collaboration with clients is critical for success. And so as we've discussed, for the PFS, the primary challenge was finding the small number of relevant comments from the much larger pool of submitted comments or finding that needle in the haystack. We, there focus, we therefore focused on identification of relevant comments, but for a smaller rule, we may have focused on subclassification of different topic areas. Continued collaboration throughout the rule is also important for making the most of these advanced data science methods. We're not conducting research studies here. We want to optimize for operational efficiency and effectiveness, not for evaluation of a fixed lock solution. And what we found is that iterative refinements during the rule can be very helpful. Finally, this work fits in with the broader goals of the government that are related to data modernization and the use of advanced data science methods. And in particular, our rulemaking process fits in with using all available data, including unstructured data, rapid deployment, and in this case, redeployment as things are iteratively improved during the rulemaking process, and support for real-time decision-making, data sharing and dissemination, and the use of automation. So and with that, I think we're happy to take questions and I will turn it back over to Cindy to moderate. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of the panelists now we'll move into questions, and we do have a few of them in the Q&A. So let's start out with two questions that are pretty similar. One is, what would be an example of a clustering? So let's start there and, and kind of move on to the next one. 
wants to take that one? So I can start, I'm not sure what the um, question is specifically asking, but in general, the clustering is an agnostic process. So it just bases it based on the text. There's no um, assumptions when it starts and then it groups related letters together. And what happens is you'll see that if there's a form letter that's been submitted, what you'll start to see is that there might be a cluster of just that form letter. So if, if it's really a true form letter where all the text is the same, that may be one cluster. Sometimes what you see is that there's a second version of that form letter that is just slightly different and that could end up in a second cluster if there's enough data. Um, and sometimes the clusters are less, um, you know, they're not, exact text, but they may be more thematically related. So they may be all making a similar point and they may end up in, this, in the same cluster for that reason. Okay, so are they predefined or developed as you go? They're not predefined. They're driven entirely by the letters themselves. So, um, and I don't know if someone else wants to talk about the embeddings that are uh, assigned to the text as they're being processed then are used to create the clusters. And so it's completely driven by the data science process. Okay, and then the last part of that is how often are they updated? So the clusters are updated every night as is everything. So everything runs every night um, and the clusters are updated every night until that point at which we freeze the clusters. And once we freeze the clusters, they're still updated every night in terms of the new um, comments that are coming in being added to clusters, but the clusters can no longer change at that point. So prior to that point, every night the clusters can shift. So you, uh, you know, I think Anna mentioned you can go from nine to 10, um, a, a comment that was in cluster one can move to cluster three, um, and after the freeze date, that will stop to happen, stop happening, but the clusters will still be updated every night. They will also be updated with any of these click button runs that we do. So that runs the full pipeline, which includes keyword tagging, clustering, and um, the model relevance. Great, and then question for Rob came in. Rob, how do you handle lags in receiving comments on regulations.gov? In my experience, these comments can take over two weeks to appear after they are submitted. Yeah, um, so we've noticed that as well too. Um, I think some of the things we picked up is sometimes when they're saved as a draft, it's not available on regulations.gov, but you can see it in FDMS. Um, another sort of related problem is that uh, sometimes regulation, the regulations.gov API goes down or, you know, they very recently also had a um, kind of like a version change, which threw us off a little bit. Uh, so basically um, going back to, to, to Kim's slides, uh, there, there actually are two different processes, even though they're they're kind of commingled. We have this kind of prioritized review as well as the sequential review. And um, we didn't really go into the sequential review part, but uh, as kind of a, um, a safeguard, we also have folks every day looking at FDMS to, for the, the latest comments um, and checking to see if there are differences between what's coming in through the prioritized review and what uh, they see in FDMS. Um, so, between the two, we end up usually catching everything. Uh, though, obviously, the the things that aren't going through um, aren't yet in regulations.gov aren't available for that prioritized uh, detailed information. Yeah, and I'll just add something here. This is actually why we reconfigured the pipeline earlier this year to run um, on a folder of, of files of HTML and PDF files. So. Um, it is also possible if somebody is getting extracts from FDMS, which are um, typically HTML files, maybe with some attachments, they, we could have that as a backup and run the pipeline on that, um, those file extracts. The other option is, although this is very intensive, is if there is a smaller rule and somebody wanted to download the comments and put them in a folder, it could run on PDFs or um, other documents. Thank you, Rob and Kim. Next question, can you share some review process or experience dealing with false negatives, such as the needles that were left in the haystack? Yeah, this is a good question, sort of, sort of why are they missing? And I think this is something we uh, typically try to refine um, each time and just be, be more thorough in capturing them. And, you know, I think, 
there are a couple things. One is people can make their searches broader and increase the number of comments that will end up in the prioritized review if they want to really try to um, minimize some of those. And sometimes it's, you know, there's not an obvious uh, solution. I think in our case, you know, sometimes those comments are actually found early on um, in the sequential reviews before that uh, busy time period. But it is something that we look at where we look to see if there's um, tweaks that we can make to keyword tagging. And again, other people could set that threshold for how many comments they want to end up in that prioritized review bucket differently. Um, so they could include broader terms and, you know, not have as much of a reduction in the number of comments submitted to the prioritized review, but potentially catch more, you know, more or all of their um, positive comments. Thank you, Kim. Yeah. And we have a oh. few more questions, but feel free to use the Q&A feature to add any further questions. I think Rob was going to add something. Don't worry. Okay, oh, Rob. Oh, yeah. I was just going to add to, to clarify, um, you know, be, based on our interpretation of, you know, the administrative law, we still do review, have humans review every comment. It's just a prioritization of, you know, you can review them a lot quicker if you know this whole group is form letters, right? Um, so that also helps catch those false negatives that aren't caught by the prioritized comment system. Thank you. So next question is, does the process and sorting provided to SMEs capture broadly whether the comment is in support or against the policy proposal? So we didn't include that in our um, automated pipeline. That is something that is possible and that could be added. Um, and there's a couple reasons why we didn't include that. The first is that, again, our primary focus was on finding those relevant comments. Once we find them, we knew that we were gonna take a close look at them. Um, and then also separate out the relevant comments within one submission. So a letter could contain multiple comments on different aspects of uh, the program that we're interested in supporting. And some of those could be favorable, some of those might not be favorable. And the way that our process works, we're pulling out different topic areas, maybe into different summary documents. So we were already planning on taking a close look at those and separating those. Um, comments into finer buckets for when we pass them off to the government for review. And in that process, we knew we were going to look at whether they were supportive. And often also you have, you know, some comments that are supportive, some that are mixed. And so that wasn't the focus. That certainly could be something that people could add, but I think for our purposes, it just wasn't a priority. Right, all, all the features so far were um, kind of at the identification stage and uh, less into the, the nuances of what each comment is, because we figured folks would at that point be reading them in detail. Um, but we, that's a good idea. We could do some like stance detection, perhaps, and look into it to, to help tease that out. And next question is, are the clusters assigned labels by the machine learning algorithm, or do they just go by numbers? They just go by numbers. <laughs> And then as, you know, as we start to become familiar with them, you know, and especially with, um, I think Anna showed now in the clusters, you can see the beginning text. And so it becomes easy to identify in some sense, like cluster one is all this one form letter because you see the first, um, you know, several words of that letter. And if that's what's driving the cluster, it becomes more obvious. Um, and then I think the other thing that was mentioned is for the keyword tagging, you can see the keywords that, um, drove it. And so there might be like a combination of pieces that you're looking at. Great. Thanks, Kim. And the next question is, can you speak a bit more to how you define when a comment is relevant? Or not? Yeah, so this is really driven by the topics, what is proposed in the rule and coordination with the client. And so for our purpose, we pulled in comments that were directly relevant to the proposal or, you know, if there was just um, a solicitation for comments. We also pulled in com comments that weren't directly relevant, but that were related. And so there might be some programs that are coordinating with each other or sometimes where it's not the policies that you propose, but you still want to capture those. And so we did have that bucket, but it's really driven by the clients and their preference for um, 
both what they're proposing, but also what they would want to know about as you know, potentially relevant, even if it's not directly related to their proposal. Thank you. And last question. Oh, well, now we have another one that popped in. For someone completely unfamiliar with this system, can you clarify whether it is targeted at extraction and cleaning of data or on analysis of data once extracted or both? Chime in for this one. I'd say it's a combination of both. We're, we're using regulations.gov API to, to gather everything, but once it's parsed and you know, we're doing the optical character recognition and we're getting um, yeah all that information out, to do some of the keyword tagging and some of the other downstream processes, we are doing some more data preparation processes um, to prepare it for that part. So I think that would fall under data cleaning. And then once the data is ready, it can, it can go through keyword tagging. It can be transformed into embeddings um, to support both the clustering algorithm and the relevance modeling that happened downstream. Thank you, Anna. And last question so far is, do you have some estimate or statistics on how much cost saved? after using the automation prioritization approach? We do not. <laughs> it's, a tough one. It's, a yeah. <laughs> it's a great question. I think for our purposes, it was really implemented to help with the speed um, of getting the comments to the government. And so it was really more on the side of wanting to get those comments as quickly as possible, just so that there was more time to, you know, consider if there needed to be policy changes. And so it was less about reducing, you know, as you heard for thoroughness, we still have a sequential review and, you know, potentially at some point that might be if this was refined enough and somebody had a, had a particular way of being sure that they didn't want to do the sequential review, they could get rid of it and there would be cost savings because they would be reviewing a smaller number of comments. In our case, that wasn't really the primary goal, it was really the speed. I think the other thing that um, people probably know is that you don't know how many comments are gonna come in. So for instance, with the public health emergency, we could have seen an even larger spike in comments. So you know, maybe it would have been 50,000 comments or 60,000 comments, right? Because there was a lot going on. There were a lot of policies that were changing. And so I think that, that we also wanted a process as kind of a safety net against that so that we know that we can get through the prioritized reviews quickly still even if there is a larger spike than otherwise, you know, we were expecting and get those comments to the government as quickly as possible that are relevant. And so that was really our goal. Thank you, Kim. And that completes answering the questions that came into the Q&A. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Thank you to our panelists. And this will also be recorded. It has been recorded and will be on our rti.org website. So look for it there or point others to that, that webinar if they missed it today. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, bye.